Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Paul DeVar. I'm a Distinguished Visiting Fellow here at Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy. I was formerly Undersecretary for Science at the U.S. Department of Energy, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Matt Bowen, Research Scholar with me at Columbia, and a veteran of the Department of Energy and, and National Nuclear Security Administration. This is the fourth session of the Columbia Energy Tech Revolution Forum, and today we're going to, going to discuss advanced nuclear technology and policy. Let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available online in the coming days. For those of you joining via Zoom, you can submit questions for the panelists by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Why is this topic so timely? Different technologies for nuclear power have always been scientifically possible. When I was studying nuclear physics at the Naval Academy, our exams regularly required us to, to derive neutron flux distributions across many different uh, theoretical reactor types. However, over three generations, much of what has been deployed have been large light water reactors. But there has been a good body of nuclear research that many other types of advanced nuclear reactors could be cheaper, smaller, more efficient, and have improved safety characteristics. In the recent decade, several private developers of advanced nuclear, with some modest help from the Department of Energy, moved the ball forward to develop designs that were ready for demonstration plants. And then finally, after a generation of debate in Washington in 2020, the U.S. government, in part under the leadership of one of our panelists, Rita Barrowall here, finally succeeded in moving forward with a significant U.S. government advanced nuclear construction co-funding program for private developers, and DOE awarded several large uh, awards for construction. Uh, since, we are, since we scheduled this, energy has become even more topical than normal with the invasion of the Ukraine and significant impacts to the energy markets, including nuclear. We have as panelists here a tremendous mix of people on this topic, uh, including the CEO of the Nuclear Energy Institute, uh, the Trade Association, we have Rita, uh, who I just commented on previously, and CEOs of the two big private developers uh, who have received new construction cost share awards from DOE. Today, we're focused on the prospects of these new advances about making a difference in the energy transition. For the panelists we have uh, uh, with us here today, we have Maria Korsnick, uh, President and CEO of the Nuclear Energy Institute and former SVP of Northeast Operations at Exelon in charge of operations for Calvert Cliffs 1 and 2, Ganae and Nine Mile Point 1 and 2. Maria has been the leader in the nuclear industry advocating for policies to advance nuclear in the U.S. for many years. She will be joined by the Honorable Dr. Rita Barrowall, CTO of Westinghouse and former Assistant Secretary of Nuclear Energy at DOE. Rita has been a leader in nuclear fuel technology for her whole career and as former assistant secretary, she uh, co-formulated and executed on the advanced nuclear uh, cost share programs that are now in full force. Our third panelist is, is Chris Levesque, president and CEO of TerraPower, a leading advanced nuclear power plant company backed by Bill Gates. Chris has been a leader in nuclear construction in both Westinghouse and Arriva, and started his nuclear career as a nuclear submarine officer, which is, I think, excellent. <laughs> and our final panelist is Dr. Uh, Mike Lawfer, uh, co-founder and CEO of Keras Power, a nuclear power plant company focused on commercializing high temperature fluoride salt reactor design. And previously he was at UC Berkeley, which I also appreciate uh, coming from DOE. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with five minute introductions of the topics and we'll start with, uh, with Maria. Well, thank you and good afternoon and a special thanks to Matt, Paul and Columbia University for having me today. If you listen closely to the discussion, you can't help but notice uh, that something is changing and what we finally changed uh, the conversation around nuclear energy in a very important way. We're no longer debating the merits of next generation reactors or whether they can pair with other carbon free renewables. We're, we're not talking about if, we're talking about when and how. I mean, the climate crisis isn't on some distant horizon anymore. It's here and it's demanding that we invest in every tool that we have to bring carbon emissions down to zero. There's a lot of uncertainty overseas right now, 
But if there's one thing I learned last year, attending COP26 and the Partnership for Transatlantic Energy and Climate uh, Cooperation, and other energy conferences uh, across the world. It, it's that we finally reached consensus on nuclear central role in the next decade. Heads of state, investors, uh, utilities everywhere, they're embracing the reality that without next generation nuclear technology, any credible plans to decarbonize are going to remain just that, plans. And, and yes, plans are important, but we need plans, but I think we're all a little bit more impressed with action. Right now, customers from Paris to Warsaw to Nashville are backing nuclear. And thanks to breakthrough innovations and historic funding from Congress and the Biden administration, the advanced reactors that they're bidding on are simpler and more seamlessly adaptable with other clean energy sources in urban and rural communities. We already have the demand to put these designs online and create the good paying jobs that follow. We have the green light from our leaders at home and across the world. And now we're on a 10 year path to meet global demands and build at scale, which is why I'm excited to engage with all of you today because you represent the pipeline of talent that will support tomorrow's fleet. From the engineers among us to our regulators and policymakers to the investors ready with private capital. We need full commitment and buy-in to meet our decarbonizing deadlines. And that's what critical mass really means. And now in a way that we haven't had before, we have the means to achieve it. I couldn't be more excited about nuclear's future or to be with you today. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, Secretary Barrowall. Great, thank you, Paul. I'm going to pull up my slides here. And let me know if you can see that okay. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, very good. So uh, thank you to Paul and Matt and to Columbia University for having me. Um, really excited to have this conversation with you today. Uh, as Maria mentioned, um, we are at a very, very crucial juncture in time. Energy is central to nearly every challenge and opportunity that the world is facing today, and that cannot be emphasized even more this week over the activities that we have um, been witnessing. So I uh, have the pleasure to be the Chief Technology Officer at Westinghouse uh, as of about uh, six weeks ago. Um, and prior to that in my career, I spent almost a decade at Westinghouse developing new technologies and new fuel. And it's really exciting for me. It feels like I'm, I'm back home and I'm able to help shape tomorrow's energy today for a cleaner and brighter future. At Westinghouse, we have about 9,000 employees that are uh, working in over 19 different countries and in 70 different facilities. The technology that was invented at Westinghouse is responsible for generating almost 50% of the world's nuclear power. And so we do, as I mentioned, have a global footprint um, in these regions. And we also have a portfolio of global products and services that range from nuclear fuel and engineering services to staffing services and the subject of this discussion, new plants. So I wanna talk about two areas of new plants. One is the AP1000 plant, which is considered a generation three plus pressurized water reactor, that's a PWR and is considered the most advanced commercially available plant that offers industry leading design that features passive safety systems. So we have several completed AP1000 reactors. This photo here shows the plants at Sandman 1 and Sandman 2. And this next image shows the plants at Haiyang 1 and Haiyang 2, all uh, which are in China. Westinghouse is also steeped in innovation. And during my last uh, tenure, bit of tenure at Westinghouse, we launched what is now called the Evinci Micro Reactor. It's a next generation reactor that is really intended for decentralized generation markets. 
meant for almost behind the meter kind of uh, electricity generation. And some of the advantages of the Evenchi include that the entire plant can be delivered in four truckload containers. The weights and sizes of the reactor and its components allow for deployment into remote areas, such as uh, Alaska in the United States. It allows for rapid scaling to meet demands that support scale up at life extension, and it minimizes decommissioning. The footprint, I think this is important uh, when we do talk about reactors compared to our partners, uh, wind, wind and solar. Um, a E. Vinci micro reactor requires a footprint of about one acre um, total for the site. The building itself is about a quarter of an acre. The amount of output from a reactor of this size um, would require um, about 40, 40 to 80 acres of solar uh, photovoltaic wind, uh, photovoltaic panels, um, or uh, about 300 acres of a wind farm. So the footprint of this reactor also is quite a bit smaller than our um, partners. So look forward to uh, having a conversation with you, but uh, I'll turn it back to Paul. Thank you. Okay, Chris. Well, thanks, Paul, and, and to uh... Columbia University to, and to Matt and my fellow panelists, and you know, a special call out to um, one of our fellow panelists, Rita Barnwell, because uh, a lot of what we're talking about today um, with ARDP, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, is a result of her work um, in uh, the Department of Energy, first beginning with GAIN, and, and then the, the creation of the program that's you know enabled these projects that that uh, you know Mike Bloffer and I are, are going to tell you about today. And um, just to come back, Paul, to your opening comments, uh, you know, I think um, we heard the themes of both clean energy and also national and international security. And, and I really look forward to the discussion today because I, I think um, what you'll, you know, what all the, um, you know, guests will hear about is you know, the importance of advanced nuclear, not just in its role in clean energy, but also in um, international security. Um, Moving on to TerraPower's role, uh, last year uh, we announced with Pacificorp uh, how we were going to change the energy grid and prepare for the future. And, and that announcement was uh, the announcement in, in Wyoming that we'd build our first natrium reactor with Pacificorp at the site of a retiring coal plant. And as 2021 went on last year, we looked at four potential sites. Uh, these were retiring coal plants. Uh, and in November, we selected uh, Kemmerer, Wyoming, as the site of our first natrium reactor. Uh, and that first natrium plant will be built at the retiring Naughton plant. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a great story here. The, the great story is about helping uh, Wyoming, a state that has been um, really a, a provider of energy for our country for over a century. Uh, we're using this project to uh, help them transition to a clean energy economy. Uh, Governor Gordon there has been uh, very supportive of the, of the project. Uh, of course, he wants to see, uh, you know, their continued, um, you know, carbon capture technologies develop, but he wants to see Wyoming be a clean energy state. And part of that clean energy um, leadership is gonna be an advanced nuclear. Uh, it's also interesting that Wyoming is so close to Idaho National Lab. Uh, you'll hear another big theme today is, is gonna be public-private partnership. Uh, so uh, we're building a nuclear power plant. Uh, Natrium, uh, you know, after Vogel, we believe will be America's next nuclear power plant in our country. And we're really excited about that. Um, we've launched the project uh, by the requirements of the ARDP. Um, it's a seven year schedule. So we have design efforts underway now. Um, over 400 engineers are working on Natrium design today at TerraPower's headquarters in Seattle at our technology development partners, uh, G. Hitachi in, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and at Bechtel in Reston, Virginia. So this project is on the move. Uh, there's, there's no ifs or stage gates about, uh, you know, whether the project, um, you know, will move to construction. We have a fully funded project. And with the um, Biden infrastructure bill, um, it assured almost the entire US government funding for the plant. And then TerraPower's private investment is, is of course, quite, quite strong. 
Um, the plant will, uh, during its construction, will peak at 2,000 uh, construction workers. And we'll have about 250 people on the plant staff, which importantly are coming from the Naughton coal plant staff. So uh, a great story here is that we're gonna be able to take advantage of, of the team at the Naughton coal plant. Uh, some folks will be, have to be retrained and licensed by the NRC, but it turns out, you know, many of your typical coal plant staff, uh, maintenance folks, electricians, um, headquarters staff can, uh, you know, they, they know how to make electrons and, uh, you know, the business end of a nuclear power plant, which is the steam plant and the generation is, is very similar and very translatable. Uh, we'll also be taking advantage of the uh, grid connection at Naughton and in the, in the cooling water at Naughton, which is, which is really important. Um, also wanna mention that, you know, the natrium technology, an advanced nuclear technology, um, really is making the, you know, clean energy grid of the future possible. Uh, for sure, there's gonna be a, a need for 24 seven clean energy as we retire 200 gigawatts of fossil in the US in the next 15 years. At the same time, we're adding wind and solar, a lot of wind, in fact, in the mountain region, a lot of solar in the Southeast. And that's creating a real need for nuclear energy uh, to replace all that 24 seven base load. But then something Natrium also does that many other um, existing nuclear plants don't do today is load following. Uh, about four years ago, after hearing many requests from utilities, um, our engineers and scientists, uh, you know, realized that natrium could be paired with molten salt storage to allow it to very quickly load follow and, and change its power output from 345 megawatts, you know, enough for 400,000 homes, uh, and ramp it up to uh, 500 megawatts in a very short period of time. So this is really going to be an optimal plant for the grid of the future that's providing clean, reliable electricity but also ramping quickly um, to serve it, you know, to serve the operators well as they uh, increase their um, intermittent supply of, of wind and solar. Um, coming back to ARDP and how important it is, um, you know, we've had developments in the national labs for decades in advanced nuclear. We have the greatest computer codes, the greatest material development, um, and then we have Con, uh, companies like uh, Kairos and, and TerraPower who have great developments. But without a demonstration program, with, without a program like Shipping Port that demonstrated uh, light water reactors in the late 50s, all of that great technology wouldn't be unlocked. And so uh, ARDP, which was um, initiated by Congress at the end of 2019, um, and then awards were made, uh, TerraPower won the demonstration plant award along with X Energy for their high temperature gas reactor in October 2020. That really launched these projects. So um, our advanced reactor project has started. Um, we're building America's next reactor in Wyoming and uh, really interested in, in the discussion today. Um, again, talking not just about the clean energy future that this technology provides, but also the importance in American and international security. Okay, thank you, Chris. And Mike? All right, uh, thanks, Paul, and thanks, Matt, uh, and everyone at Columbia for uh, the opportunity to present to the panel and to the, the fellow, uh, my fellow panelists for their perspectives uh, and for their contributions. Um, I'm probably gonna share something which may sound a little bit different uh, in terms of messaging, and then that's okay. Kairos is a little bit different from the others. We, we actually think that's, that's a good thing. Um, but I'll introduce you to Kairos and kind of give you some of our perspective about what we think it's going to take uh, for new advanced nuclear to really be competitive and, and meet the needs that it really has to. So um, Kairos is a fairly new, new company in the mix here. We're only about five years old, uh, but we emerged out of um, over a decade of work really centered in universities and national labs around a new reactor technology, which essentially combines two different aspects of, of, of reactor technologies that are well proven and established, uh, but does it in a kind of an innovative way. And I can talk a little bit about that. Um, we're a mission-driven company. Our, our mission is, is fairly ambitious. It's to enable the world's transition to clean energy uh, with the ultimate goal of improving people's quality of life while protecting the environment. And um, it, it, it really is motivating for everyone in the company to, to be working towards that mission very directly in what we're doing every day. Uh, and it's our, our firm belief that in order to achieve that, 
um, we're going to need a substantial amount of electricity generation from a technology which is both clean and affordable. Those are the necessary attributes of something which is going to be scalable, uh, not just in the United States, but also uh, throughout the world. Um, in terms of market, you know, we need to be commercially driven first. Um, so we're driven by the U.S. electricity market. And uh, when we were founded, uh, and the initial opportunity that we saw was uh, the opportunity to replace natural gas. Um, essentially, uh, if we look back at what we built out uh, in the early uh, early part of the century, in about two, between 2000 and 2005, we built out about 200 gigawatts of natural gas capacity. That's about twice of the total nuclear capacity. Uh, in the United States, although nuclear has been going a little bit down as a few plants have been retiring. Um, with the collapse of natural gas prices, with, with basically fracking, you have a lot of generation, a lot of cheap fuel. This has been the major driver, um, basically pushing coal out of the market you know, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And so this is a major narrative. And, and our, our, our goal is to be competitive, um, not just with other clean energy technologies, but with all technologies. And natural gas currently sets the bar. And so we saw that as a big opportunity uh, driving our schedule and, and where we needed to be in terms of cost. Now, with, with kind of the, the recent pushes for uh, clean energy transition, um, there is a, a more near-term opportunity, primarily with um, you know, the retirement of, of, of many coal assets uh, throughout the country. And so that's an earlier market uh, that we believe is important. Um, but ultimately, we really believe um, that there is a place for nuclear uh, to, to, to play a big role. Our timing is we're a little bit further behind for commercial deployment, but we need something that's going to be be scalable in a very significant way in the 2030s. And we think that that's really the place where new nuclear can play the biggest role. Um, I will say, I think that you know nuclear as it exists today in the United States is clean, it's reliable, uh, it's safe, um, but it's not affordable. And so that's that's the fundamental problem that needs to be resolved for for new developers uh, and new technologies and. We take that responsibility very seriously, and we think if we can achieve that goal, then, then there's a significant role for nuclear uh, for the decarbonization of the U.S. grid. Um, we look to we, we've looked very hard for other precedents uh, for taking a, a technology which is um, you know, f fairly complex and, and expensive and trying to radically reduce the cost. Um, unfortunately, there are not a lot of good examples. Um, and we keep coming back to one which, which we really think is the model for disruption, uh, and that's SpaceX and their ability to disrupt the cost in aerospace. And they've essentially beat out uh, the, the, major, you know, the major developers Boeing in aerospace. Uh, and they, they, their existence proof that a relative newcomer that's, that's, that's smaller and, and scrappier can actually do a lot and deliver things which people honestly thought was pretty impossible for companies of that type to deliver. So we use that as our inspiration. And much of our strategy is actually adapted from the strategies that made SpaceX successful. And frankly, they're, they're different from, from many of the other approaches in the nuclear space. Um, so one, you know, I'll just cover very quickly kind of the major, uh, the major drivers there that I think are most important. The first one is a recognition that conventional development cycles for, for complex technologies tend to be very big. And they're big both in terms of cost and, and time. And that that has a negative impact on the ability to move fast and quickly in the project, uh, because a lot of what you set up is process to protect the investments over a very large period of time. Nuclear time cycles are 20 to 30 years at best with many billions of dollars of investment. So that, that nature of the problem is very challenging. Trying to reduce that time scales and cost with smaller iterations uh, to develop your, your technology along the way and prove and learn along the way is, is highly valuable and something that Kairos has adapted. Uh, we've received a, a risk reduction award uh, from the DOE uh, to do a smaller scale reactor. Um, we, we made that decision less than two years ago. We submitted the construction permit application for it last fall. It's currently under review by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We have a non-nuclear version of that, that system, which is currently being constructed at our test facility in Albuquerque. So the ability to move quickly um, is something that we view as really essential and is not, not necessarily you know, thought to be possible within the nuclear development space. And part of the ability to do that is enabled by uh, what we think is a really robust fundamental safety case that allows us to be more innovative in the parts of the plant that are not important to safety. And I'll just say the, the, the last component about the ability to reduce costs um, and also inspired by the SpaceX model is around vertical integration. Um, there are lots of issues and challenges with the nuclear supply chain. Um, we think it's really important that, that, 
that delivery of, of every part of the system needs to be motivated by, by parties who are going to be motivated really to drive costs down. And unfortunately, when you have um, really specific uh, quality requirements and low volume, that's not a good recipe to have motivated suppliers, especially when there's technology development. And so along the way, Kairos is also standing up, not just the testing, but also the manufacturing uh, to deliver our product. And so we think, we think that that's the model for success. And we think that um, it, it puts us in a position where we'll be ready to start ramping up you know, commercial deployment of reactors in the early 2030s, when we're really gonna need uh, you know, a substantial amount of dispatchable non-carbon emitting uh, capacity on the grid. And it's going to have to come from something, and we think nuclear is a is a good fit for that. If it if it can be cost competitive. Okay, thanks for that, Mike. Um, it's my privilege to get to ask some questions of the panelists before we move to audience Q and A. I'll I'll start with Maria. Um, so we've seen this phenomenon in recent years that states have passed clean energy standards uh, that would require their power grids to be uh, essentially low carbon by roughly mid century. And in addition, some major utilities have made these voluntary targets announced of zero carbon by mid-century as well. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you can explain to the audience how you see a sort of firm capacity resources like nuclear power plants working together with the variable renewable energy resources like wind and solar to, to reach these highly decarbonized systems. Great, absolutely. Um, so I guess let me just start with wind and solar are a necessary part of this solution. And um, really, as we look at nuclear, nuclear's there, 724, 365, around the clock, it's scalable. So it's really a wonderful partnership between wind, solar, and nuclear. Ultimately, that's going to form the backbone, if you will, of this clean energy grid. I think one of the best examples to sort of demonstrate this is um, in the state of Washington, there's a company there, Energy Northwest, and when the governor, Governor Inslee, um, made a commitment to be carbon-free by 2045, it created the need for people to say, all right, well, how are we going to do that, and how are we going to look ahead? And they commissioned a study to look at how to decarbonize uh, their grid uh, over, I think it was a 20-year period, and they did one study that was all renewables, and they did a study that that included their current nuclear, uh, which is their Columbia generating station, as well as uh, some SMRs. And the nuclear version, um, if you will, saved customers $8 billion, billion with a B, a year. And so that's just you know, an example of how adding nuclear, that scalable, always there resource, lowers the system cost, which at the end of the day, that's what customers are paying. And it gives you a more reliable grid. I would just say using resources sort of more effectively and efficiently. You're using those renewables when you have them, when they're there, but when they're not there, you have carbon-free dispatchable energy uh, available to you. Okay. And, and Rita, the geopolitics of energy is, is um, a topic of uh, much discussion in, in recent days. And when you were at Department of Energy, DOE published a report restoring America's competitive nuclear energy advantage, with, which dealt with some of these geopolitical and national security considerations. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, you know, look outside the United States and, and talk with folks, why should somebody in the United States care about who countries choose to work with on their civil nuclear energy programs? Um, I, I think this this topic is very very timely for for this week, um, and it, it certainly is important uh, which countries um, choose U.S. technology and which countries choose other countries' uh, nuclear technology. Um, there are certainly, as you mentioned, potential geopolitical ties. Uh, there are strings attached with some countries' offerings, and uh, there could be um, unintended consequences or repercussions if a certain country's technology is selected. Um, I can tell you that during my time in DOE, um, we had numerous conversations with many different delegations from uh, countries that were looking to deploy new nuclear, and they were absolutely entertaining U.S based technology for a handful of reasons, but um, what often came up in conversation was the trustworthiness 
um, of the technology that was based in the United States, the transparency with uh, interacting with the developers of that technology, and the fact that we could be uh, from the United States be trusted for embarking on what hopefully would be a hundred year relationship with these nations. Gotcha. Um, Chris, uh, you know, all, all of the reactors in the United States that are in operation use uh, uh, fuel that's cooled by water, but the, the reactor design you're pursuing uses sodium and even a somewhat different fuel design. Can you, can you explain to the audience the safety case behind the natrium reactor? Sure, Matt. And before I come to the safety, I just want to maybe just continue one point Rita made about the national security imperative of us moving forward with advanced nuclear energy in, in the US. Um, you know, the 100 reactors we had in the US, unfortunately, we're down to 92, have been very safe, very reliable. And, uh, you know, we really want to see life extensions. We we need that clean energy on, on the grid. But if you look around the world, uh, look at China and Russia, they've you know, basically used our light water technology that we demonstrated first at Shipping Port, and they've moved on. If you look at the ARDP award winners, so for the demo awards, uh, you know, Terra Powers, Natrium Sodium Fast Reactor, X Energy's High Temperature Gas Reactor, Kairos Molten Salt Reactor, these are all using non-water coolants. Um, these are advanced nuclear or generation four plants. If you go look at China and Russia, China has an active project for a high temperature gas reactor. In fact, it's already gone commercial. They have an active sodium reactor project and an active molten salt project. Uh, Russia likewise already has commercialized a sodium fast reactor. So between now and 2050, China and Russia will be out there on the world market bringing nuclear energy to countries who don't even have nuclear energy today. And we absolutely have to provide US options as nuclear energy is, is deployed to these new countries. We have to bring US influence, um, US relationships, and US safety, security, and nonproliferation standards, in addition to bringing clean energy to growing economies. So back to the kind of technical side of why we feel good about uh, plants that are not water cooled. Uh, a lot of us at Terra Power were former light water reactor operators and uh, really believe in, in the safety of, of light water plants. But when we go back and look at a sodium cooled plant, uh, first you have to wrap your mind around a plant being cold by sodium. But then when you realize that this is a plant that has an operating temperature about 500 degrees centigrade, and the boiling temperature of the coolant is almost 900 degrees. So anyone who's operated a light water reactor before, it has to think about you know, proximity to boiling and things like decay heat removal and an unexpected event. We have 400 degrees centigrade margin from operating temperature to, to boiling. And natrium also has a, a metallic fuel, um, which is an excellent thermal conductor. And it stores very little energy. When, when fission stops after a scram, there's very little energy left in the fuel. And then unlike at Fukushima, where they had to rely on you know, diesel engines for cooling, natrium has chimneys, it has air chimneys around the reactor vessel that would remove heat uh, following an ex unexpected event. You know, just like a light water reactor, they would scram, the fission would stop in, a, in less than a second. But we have an always on air cooling system. And, you know, that, that's good for safety, but it's also good for cost also, because uh, you don't need the extra safety systems to start a diesel, to start pumps. It's an always on air cooling system. So, um, you know, it's really time for us to move forward. When we talk about safety, okay, let's talk about the safety of the plant, but let's talk about the safety of the world too. And we really need the US to be involved in nuclear energy deployment around the world for international safety and security. And these plants that we're working on are very safe. Okay, thanks. And Mike, I was gonna ask basically the same question, um, how you'd explain the safety case behind uh, the FHR you guys are pursuing. Sure, so um, Chris kind of set me up um, with, with half the story around low pressure coolants. Um, but essentially I mentioned in the intro that we combine two um, proven nuclear technologies, one of which is coated particle fuel. 
it's the same type of fuel that that uh, was developed for for gas reactors, which is the technology that X Energy is going to be demonstrating uh, in in Washington. It's essentially you know tiny kind of poppy sized seed particles of, of fuel with many coatings. Those serve essentially as the containment barriers. Um, it's the most robust nuclear fuel that's ever been developed. Um, you know, basically containing everything up to about 1600 centigrade or or higher. Um, it's typically combined with helium. We actually combine it with with a salt, uh, which um, was developed historically to be for fu fluid fuel reactors where the fuel was dissolved. And so essentially we have a low pressure, high temperature coolant, similar to what Chris described, uh, but we're combining it with, with the solid fuel rather than the fluid fuel. Essentially, those are our two most important barriers to provide, um, you know, to contain um, the radioactive fission products from, from the fission. And, Essentially, that provides the safety case for the reactor. So, so our um, our application for for the the test reactor that, that's being reviewed by the NRC right now uh, essentially asserts that those two barriers are actually sufficient to provide the same level of safety that conventional reactors provide with lots of big heavy equipment and structures um, in terms of protecting health and safety of the public. Now, you can't run a power plant with that, so we have to have piping and we have to have structures. And so our contention is actually that everything that the owner needs to do to protect the investment envelopes everything that has to be done to ensure health and safety of the public. So you don't have to add costs to the system uh, for, for safety for the public. Everything that you're doing is aligned with what you need to do first to protect the plant operators and then to protect the investment. So everything is, is aligned. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about that safety case is it, it decreases the physical footprint about what's important to safety. And so it allows us to do innovative things for much larger portions of the plant because the safety significance is significantly less. And so that basically our contention that we can move faster with iterative technology development and testing when it's not nuclear. And so that allows us to move fast at our facilities with a lot of the salt technology and develop it more quickly because it's not tied into this slow nuclear development cycle. It's really non-nuclear development. Okay, interesting. Uh, Maria, I want to come back to geopolitics and uh, for, for other countries when they're considering new reactor builds, uh, they, they of course have a, a variety of different options, different reactor vendors around the world, which typically bring offers of government-backed financing to support those, those reactor exports. And I was hoping you could talk about what role financing plays in international nuclear energy commerce and the types of offers that U.S. competitors make to nations considering new, new builds and, and whether and how the U.S. is able to match those offers. Great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, just sort of start basically um, and kind of build on, on what Chris Levesque um, teed up, and that is that um, if you look at what uh, the United States um, has to offer, uh, we really want companies to do business with us. Uh, we want them to do business with us because of our operational excellence. Uh, we want them to do business with us because you know we have non-proliferation standards and things that we put in place. And as Chris mentioned, when you do business on nuclear, you're really forming this 100-year relationship. You know, it, it's going to take a handful of years to build uh, the nuclear plant. You're going to operate it for 60 to 80 years, uh, maybe even longer. You're going to decommission it. And so doing business with nuclear is really a, an opportunity for a very strong government-to-government -government and country-to-country -country relationship. But the United States isn't the only one that figured that out. And so China and Russia, uh, as we've mentioned, they're really going gangbusters for nuclear. They've invented some new products, but mostly they're interested in doing business with you on nuclear to form that long-term relationship that I just talked about. And why is that? Because they have geopolitical interest in controlling your energy supply. And we don't have to look any farther than what's playing out right now over in Europe as we work through the challenges that are happening in Ukraine and realize that the dependency on Russian gas today uh, is very much a challenge uh, for Europe. And so we also need to take a look at that and say, let's not transplant that idea right into nuclear. And how do you stop that? Well, you, you 
provide some attractive financing, you encourage um, the dialogue and the discussion. And quite frankly, as Rita mentioned, what we're finding in these other countries is they actually do want to do business uh, with the United States. But sometimes it's that financing piece that actually takes you across the finish line. And um, I'll be honest, some of these state-owned enterprises, you know, they almost make a deal that's, you know, sort of too good to be true. Um, let me build it for you. Let me operate it for you. Let me take your used fuel. And, you know, when you make these sort of super sweet deals, it's too good to be true. As Rita said, it comes with some strings attached, uh, like, you know, I'll control it now. Um, and uh, as opposed to you do business with the United States, we want to team together with you to get it constructed. We want you to benefit from it. We want you to get the jobs uh, that are associated with this project. And we want you to prosper um, as a result of it. So financing is really, really key to getting these deals across the finish line. Encouraging that, uh, you know, just within the last year or so, uh, DFC changed their uh, prohibition on doing business uh, with nuclear. So that's a positive sign. We really need the XM Bank to sort of step up a bit. They're getting engaged in some of the larger uh, nuclear projects, and, and I'll just say that's, you know, a work in progress. Uh, that's something that we're engaged on um, on behalf of, of the industry. But I just can't emphasize enough how important financing is. And, and, and just tag on one last thing. Um, for th folks that maybe have been following the EU taxonomy, it's really been in the news um, over the last uh, several months. And we've really been pushing hard to ensure that nuclear is a part of the taxonomy. The taxonomy determines whether or not you're sort of considered as sort of ESG and, and whether or not you're considered, uh, you know, sort of good for the environment. Um, and nuclear initially was not included uh, in that taxonomy. And um, at the end of the day, we're working to ensure that nuclear does stay a part of that taxonomy. But that also goes to financing, right? Because it'll say whether or not investing in nuclear is considered, uh, you know, sort of a, a green investment, uh, if you will. And it's very, very important that nuclear get the credit that it so deserves which is, yes, it's carbon-free, and it needs to be treated like that with all the other carbon-free technologies. Okay. Um, Rita, I think when we started planning this event, you were at EPRI, and, 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 and since then, you've started at Westinghouse. I was hoping you could talk about, um, you, you mentioned the AP1000s in China. I was hoping you could also talk about you know, some of the factors you think have led to the, the delays and cost overruns with the US AP1000s, and also perhaps maybe some of the reasons why you think uh, uh, builds may, maybe in Poland, uh, paying off what uh, Maria just mentioned, maybe why subsequent builds might have shorter construction times. Sure. So uh, let, let's start with the first one um, on the cost overruns for the AP1000s in the US. My opinion um, is that these builds were essentially first of a kind. We had not constructed new nuclear in this country for decades. And with that first of a kind came a revitalization of the, the nuclear construction supply chain. And so we're, we're essentially building new capabilities and new, new capacity. It's not really new, but we're reinvigorating it. Um, and with that comes, comes uh, a lot of learning. And, and so those resulted in cost overruns and, and schedule delays. I, 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 I tongue in cheek often chat about um, this with the fact that at around a couple of years ago, we redid our back patio. And that was a three month job and also came with cost overruns and schedule delays. And so for something that small to have those two issues done by uh, a, you know, a landscaper that knows this, this business and has done it for decades, and you take something as, as just the magnitude of an AP1000 construction bill that is essentially first of a kind, it's not unusual. It's not, to me, it's not a surprise. It's, you know, um, it's not ideal, but it's not a surprise. So that said, take the lessons learned from the Sandman builds, from the Haiyang builds, from the Vogel builds, and you apply, especially what we do in the nuclear industry, we apply lessons learned so that we don't repeat mistakes of the past. So we're applying those lessons learned to the new builds that are planned for Poland. Um, and then the other new builds that are going to occur around the world um, that I'm very optimistic about. 
And we're, we're confident that those construction schedules are going to be closer to plan and the, the budgets will be also closer to plan. Uh, in addition, for Poland especially, we've got a lot of collaboration um, with, with partners. And so that is also, I think, uh, good news as as we move forward with these new builds that we've got this the strength from the supply chain across the industry that we have built up through the Vogel builds and we're applying it to the new builds. Okay, thanks. Uh, Chris, um, maybe we'll stay with the theme of uh, difficulties in constructing first of a kind mega projects, which certainly in the West, uh, there are no shortage of examples energy and non-energy that have gone over schedule and over budget. And I'm curious how you all at TerraPower are thinking about this. What's your, what's your plan to um, try to keep things reasonably on schedule? Yeah, so I think it's important for us all to acknowledge, like Rita said, the US is out of practice designing and building new nuclear power plants, as well as Europe. There are no success examples in the US or Europe for a new nuclear design being built in the last 30 years. So that's why we need programs like ARDP that um, you know, help us get over some of the speed bumps with some of the investments that need to be made in the, in the supply chain um, in, in licensing. Um, but the US is capable of doing this. Um, I, I have to tell you the best examples of nuclear projects I've seen in the US were when I worked on submarines. Uh, when I served on the USS Boise in the 1990s, the US Navy was delivering three nuclear powered submarines per year. We had it down to a science. It, it was a machine. That's where we need to get again. Um, so as we engage in these advanced technologies now, you know, how do we build up that experience again? First, we have to be honest about where we are. Okay, we have to recognize that uh, there's not many people under the age of 60 who built a new nuclear plant in the U.S. Sadly, go to Russia and China, there's people in their 30s who have multiple new builds under their belt. And, and that's why we have to work with, with policymakers. We, we have to, um, you know, again, have, have programs in place, have licensing reforms that uh, have supply chain uh, support like the uh, loan program office. That, that help us get over all these speed bumps as we get back into new nuclear builds. But then it does come down to the project management and, and the team that you have given you know, the situation you have with, with our inexperienced supply chain and, and, and workforce. And what TerraPower has done is we've put together a great team. In fact, to win the ARDP demonstration award, there were three criteria, the strength of the technology, the strength of the business case, and the strength of the team. And that's why we came together with Giatachi as a technology development partner and with Bechtel as our AE and constructor. So um, we have a, a successful project so far. We, we've, we're one year into the seven year project. We met all of our ARDP milestones last year and there'll be challenges ahead. And we're uh, staying close between the three companies. We, we have regular president's meetings you know, with, with Bechtel and, and GE. Uh, in a very tight coordination with Department of Energy, who is our partner in, in ARDP. Half the bill is being paid for by the US government. So um, a lot of support from, uh, from Congress, from the DOE, and even the NRC, who's, who's really leaning into uh, licensing these new designs. I'm confident we can get through it. We have one year of great, great success here on achieving all the milestones. And I think the other thing on our side is these first plants are smaller than the Gen 3 plants and they're simpler as well. You know, uh, natrium is 345 megawatts. It's not a gigawatt scale plant. And then I was also talking about the safety systems, which, which are quite simple. You know, we're relying on uh, air cooling, uh, you know, not safety related INC, safety related diesels and, and pumps. So that smaller, simpler plant is, is really, um, you know, an ideal way for the for the U.S. to get back into this. Uh, someday we'll be building bigger plants again. Uh, you know, there's going to be multiple, and, and I want to make this point, you know, the competition between the advanced reactor developers isn't really going to be about who has the greatest deal, okay? It's going to be about who can deliver the first plant successfully. And whoever can run that gauntlet, 
Gen 4 companies, light water SMR companies, whoever can survive that gauntlet will have a huge opportunity. The addressable market for clean nuclear energy with, with some of the macro issues that I was talking about with all the retirements of fossil, uh, the doubling or tripling of electricity demand between now and 2050. I mean, electric vehicles are going to at least double electricity demand in the US, which has kind of been flat for the last 30 years. Uh, whoever can be successful running that gauntlet of the first project is gonna have a huge economic opportunity. Okay, thanks. Um, Mike, I'm hoping you can expand on what you were starting to talk about there in, in the last uh, earlier when you were talking about taking inspiration from SpaceX and, and maybe talk about how Kairos is approaching reactor design and manufacturing. And maybe also piggyback on what people have just been talking about on the construction theme, you know, what, what you're seeing in terms of um, the EPC approach to building reactors in the United States and how you all are, are, are planning to approach it. Sure. So um, I guess once again, you may get something which, which sounds a little bit different. Um, and I, I actually, again, I, I think that, that that's appropriate. So um, I think the, so the challenge of delivering reactor systems, which with, with both Rita and Chris you know, spoke about, um, these systems are not easy to build. Um, and especially if, if there's not iterations that allow, allow people to do that. So, so our approach is fundamentally to enable those iterations so that you don't go in to build the first nuclear plant um, you know, with those uncertainty. And we have the non-nuclear demonstrations, which you know, I'll, I'll say there was initially kind of a joke, which was if you have multiple nuclear build projects where your costs are double what you initially thought, maybe you would actually be better off building one just for practice. Uh, instead of trying to do, and that was kind of a joke, but it turns out you can actually build those iterations for much less than the full plans and get the learning and follow the learning. And I'll say, you know, th there's kind of a rule of thumb on on learning curves in energy systems, which is very rough, and and this is this is not 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 applicable across the board. But in general, if you build a hundred times more of a technology, you can roughly reduce the capital cost by about a factor of. of, of so you, you basically half the cost as you build 100. And so this is a learning curve. Nuclear is against this curve, and there's actually been a positive, like, like the costs go up as you build more in certain countries, but it's not impossible. Um, the Koreans um, actually followed that curve pretty closely, and they did it by having the same crews running iterative constructions and having that knowledge transfer. So that's built in. The French actually did a little bit better by about 5 to 10 percent. So it's not impossible for nuclear to learn, but the two things that matter are where do you start on that curve? Because if you're starting really high, even if you're coming down, you're not going to be low enough in cost, even if you're learning. Or, you know, and you need to be able to have the opportunity to do the iteration and have an organization that is motivated to actually learn. Because the learning doesn't happen by itself. You actually, it, it, it's hard. It, it takes a lot of work to, to do that learning. So, so we're set up, you know, I talked about the iterative development. Initially, that was conceived around the reactor system, hardware, you know, the, 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 the vessels, the pumps, the heat exchangers, those types of components. Um, what we're appreciating now is that that learning also has to apply to the construction. And so, you know, as with other things, if we can't find motivated partners who have the right alignment and incentives, we have to take on more ourselves. And we're, we're actually doing that on the construction side. So with our non-nuclear um, projects, Kairos is taking on construction management directly which will translate between those projects eventually to what we're, we're, we're doing for Hermes, um, which is our test reactor. So that experience, again, you know, kind of a new approach and, and having the internal motivation, no one's gonna be more motivated than us to deliver that project on cost and on schedule. Um, and that's, that's important. I think that, that you know, part of the challenge, you know, the, the scale is part of the challenge of conventional builds, but also, um, the complexity of working with, with lots of different partners with different motivations. And when a project goes over budget by a lot, there's gonna be a lot of finger pointing and you spend a lot of time arguing about contracts about who's actually responsible for those cost overruns rather than figuring out how to actually get the project back on track. And so we're trying to cut out a lot of that um, by taking on more of ourselves. And it's different, it's, it's, it's not easy, but we think that that's, that's really actually the model to, for success here. And, um, we find that that I, I'll I'll point out that that you know 
what we really need is nuclear to be be lower in cost by not just 10 to 20 percent by, by a factor of a couple and so that that's really that's really challenging that requires a very different model of how to deliver the technology and you know i i hope that we have many successes but it, it's not clear to me that that conventional approaches are going to be able to deliver more than you know tens of percentages and that's that's actually going to be an impressive thing but that's not going to be good enough to be where nuclear needs to be it's and um, you know, we need to be thinking in terms of those types of radical cost reductions and what type of strategies are going to get us there. And it's going to require something that is going to look different from the way that conventional nuclear has been developed in the past. Okay, that's the perfect stopping point. Uh, maybe move to audience Q&A at this point. Uh, Paul? Okay, great. By the way, <clears throat> the other thing on this construction point, Mike, you were just discussing and others, you know, there's actually been a bit of a positive turnaround. Um, on, on some things in the last few years around uh, nuclear construction at DOE, actually a whole series of projects have come online ahead of schedule and under budget, which you don't hear that a lot in nuclear panels <laughs> to talk about ahead of schedule and under budget. Uh, and that's a longer, that's a longer conversation about, you know, learning curves and so on, but things can get done. Um, and so I, I like to be a little positive on that. I like to talk about uh, like really uh, you know there's some a bunch of questions I want to ask about the uh, about about the international policy. Um, uh, I know I've talked to several of you about this, uh, but uh, you know very specifically on questions around international policy, what should the U.S. government do? What a specific execution uh, um, kind of levers? Uh, do you recommend uh, that the U.S. government go do to try to make a greater opportunity for, you know, members of NEI and you all as developers? You know, what very specifically should the U.S. government be doing to facilitate uh, you all as, uh, as the developers internationally? Maria, maybe I'll start with you. Great, thanks, Paul. Well, um, I'll just kind of reflect a bit on the, the comments that I made. I, I do think we have to look at financing. Um, you know, you'll you'll hear intergovernmental agreements, you'll hear sort of signals that are being sent that sound very positive. But when you get down to it, you know, people are looking at, okay, how can I finance this thing? And, and I think we're incredibly conservative um, in, in some of our financing rules. Um, as an example, we don't take any equity positions, uh, you know, in financing. If we would, you know, if we would even take a small equity position, honestly, these countries could lever that and say, hey, look, you know, the U.S. government um, is, is sort of willing to, you know, to, to, to stand behind this. And so, you know, I don't want to go into sort of the nitty gritty on sort of other things, but I, I really just want to, uh, to, to share that we need to put some, you know, sort of smart financing ideas around ways that we could encourage the U.S. government, XM Bank, you know, and sort of others to really understand the geopolitical significance and encourage the nuclear partnership for all the reasons that we said. You know, it's sort of more than just go build that project. It's sort of, it's even more than just go build that carbon free project, even though that alone is significant. It's go form that geopolitical relationship for over a hundred years. And this is something that as a nation we want to do for national security, as well as carbon free energy. You know, nuclear needs to be up at that level in these government to government conversations and not down at, at you know, sort of Rita's company level, sort of Westinghouse trying to make a deal with some other, you know, uh, company company in another country. It needs to be a, a government to government conversation. And I'll tell you, that's what it is for Russia and China. Chris or Rita or Mike, any other comments about specific policy recommendations for US government support? Well, Maria outlined it well. And, you know, the, the companies like Westinghouse and, and TerraPower take part regularly uh, in, in discussions that are convened by NEI with, with leaders in, in Congress and, and state and, and NSA. So we're, we're really trying to work more closely with the US government because as, as Rita said, China and Russia, industry and government are one and the same, right? And, and we, we would not wish to have their system. Uh, we, we prefer our, our free economy and our independent companies uh, that are not state owned. But we do need to play their game. We, we have um, a dangerous world out there uh, nuclear energy is, is very important for um, 
energy security, but also, uh, you know, it's geopolitically very strategic. So we have to work very, very closely with, with the government. And we probably do need to uh, act with more urgency than we have in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, we, we need to bring US technologies to Europe, for example. We, we have to help get Europe off Russian natural gas. I mean, I think that's, that's clear this week. Um, another policy change, or, or I should say program, we, we really, really need um, and, and this is you know, more about domestic supply chain, we need US enrichment capability for high assay, low enriched uranium. Uh, many of the ARDP award winners, the Gen 4 technologies use um, high assay, low enriched uranium, which today cannot be produced in the US. Um, there were plans to possibly import it from uh, Russia as, as a bridge until the US could get this capability. That's clearly uh, impossible, and, and none of us would want to use uh, Ru Russian enrichment on, on our advanced reactors. Um, so now it's time for the U.S. to accelerate this program. And um, you know, we have some great policy in place with ARDP and the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act. We we now need to figure out how to jumpstart U.S. enrichment of high assay, low enriched uranium as a public-private partnership. Uh, the, the Energy Act of 2020 uh, laid this out and, and said DOE needs to create the capability, but the funding is kind of stalling in the reconciliation bill this year. So, uh, you know, TerraPower, NEI, and, you know, other companies are really engaging the government strongly on, on this point. Uh, and, you know, TerraPower is willing to bring forward more, more private investment, but we, it's, you know, it's a public-private partnership. We, we really need to get the government on board with this as well. So let me ask that uh, Halu question. Uh, it's a bit linked to what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia. Obviously, uranium, uh, enriched uranium, uh, is uh, in part uh, supplied by Russia. And although most of what's been discussed on television in the last uh, couple of weeks has been focused on oil and natural gas, um, I think a little bit less well known is the exposure to the world, including us on uh, enriched uranium, uranium overall, but, you know, the enrichment side in, in particular. Um, you know, you, you all are the front lines of this uh, topic. Um, what do you think, I mean, how do you think uh, that gets managed? How, you know, what's your, obviously there's some worry on that supply chain to be, uh, if we're watching the crude markets today, um, even though there's no government sanctions, uh, com private companies are not wanting to take Russian crude today. And there's a big lockup happening today, based on on, on individuals, individual entities, not not governments, saying we don't want to we don't want to deal with Russian oil and gas right now, um, and that could certainly you know uh, you know happen in, in nuclear. Uh, any thoughts around uh, this uh, this Russia Ukraine topic, and how you think a bit longer term? In addition, of course, what you just said. I guess I could jump in. Uh, others might might want to add. You know, uh, clearly the the fuel market is an international market, and um, as as you mentioned, um, you know, currently there is. Um, you know, a portion of that market um, that, that Russian does business, uh, we do business with Russia. And I, I'll point back to um, what, uh, what Chris Levesque said that, you know, as we look ahead, uh, we're very much, you know, looking to ensure that we don't have dependency on Russia for, for the high assay LEU. And, um, you know, we're very interested as we look at that international market to ensure uh, that that risk is appropriately spread in the international market. And um, we also uh, created a, um, uh, a repository, if you will, uh, to sort of build up uh, a collection uh, of uranium and so that it helps us sort of mitigate these. And I think we need to really look at that and make sure that we can even sort of do more uh, with that uh, insurance fund, if you will, uh, to make sure that we have uh, sufficient uranium uh, for all of the, uh, the, the plants that, that we have today. But uh, obviously very much something that we wanna make sure that uh, we keep that sort of international component uh, and, and keep the, the fuel supply healthy. I'll jump in actually with a, with a quick take on that one, which is, um, and it also kind of think goes back to the last question, Paul, about kind of the, the global kind of geopolitical influence that comes with, with nuclear. Yeah, you know, I, I think th there's a lot of demand right now, but it's for a relatively small number of projects who actually have the need for that material. And 
I think that the, the best thing that we can do is um, create a reactor product that utilities want to buy large numbers of. And then we have the technology readiness and enrichment is there, right? That's not, that's not the thing that's holding back the technology. We have direct enrichment capability. We can't do high assay, but if there's a demand signal for the reactors, that has the feedback loop to justify the investment. And so the burden is on us to create a product that's worth that investment. Now, there's, there's a separate issue around the down blending for, for light water reactors in the current fleet, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna touch on that one. I would say the other, just, just the other quick thought I have on the discussion around kind of the, the geopolitical influence and different countries kind of trying to, to export nuclear technologies. Um, from my perspective, the reason why we're developing the technologies is to decarbonize. And so where the technology should go is where it's gonna have the biggest impact to decarbonize. And that's actually not a huge list of countries. It's, it's the US, it's China, and in, in you know, a decade or two, it's gonna be India. Uh, and so personally, you know, our strategy is, um, we really view the US as the, the, our primary market that we need to be competitive in. We have specific opportunities to, to enter that market if we can develop a cost competitive project. And if we do that, then the US can lead the way in decarbonization and set the model rather than try and export the technology to have others to, to decarbonize. And I think that, that you know, there, there's, there's also kind of, when, when there are new nuclear technologies, it's important for us to avoid the idea that we're going to other countries because it's easier than doing it in the US. That's, you know, when, when people are concerned about safety, that doesn't have the right kind of messaging that you're going there because it's easier. Well, why, can, why don't you do it in the US first? I think that this is an area where we need to lead the way with, with US technology deployed in the US Let's prove that we're cost competitive, and then we can export it and and help the rest of the world decarbonize. But I think it's um, it's it, it, the goal is decarbonization, and I think moving away from this idea of, of kind of the, the geopolitical influence of of the the, the export of nuclear technology is important. The goal is is to decarbonize. That's 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 what's driving us. Okay, and then yeah, good time. Go ahead, Chris. I just want to say uh, there's some real urgency here. Um, you know, we we have. Uh, again, a massive number of, of fossil plants retiring in, in the U.S., okay, and, uh, you know, solar in the southeast, wind in the mountain, uh, wind in the mountain region are, are growing a lot. Um, we need to have nuclear technologies available, uh, or there will be some crowding out. Uh, nuclear energy needs to move forward now to, you know, replace this fossil that, that's coming offline. Um, and, and then the same thing is going to happen internationally. If, if we're not bringing multiple advanced nuclear technologies, American technologies to the international market at the beginning of the 2030s, we will be crowded out by, uh, by Chinese or Russian technology. So th there's a real sense of urgency here. Um, that's why we have to fix this, this fuel supply chain now. Uh, you know, we, we can't wait. Um, you know, the clean energy needs and, you know, the need for U.S. leadership in, in, in nuclear, uh, both, you know, both demand this urgency. Okay, and then what, the last uh, question uh, uh, group that kind of came in, uh, I'll, I'll ask about is about regulatory uh, review and, and, and approvals. Um, uh, my friends at ClearPath uh, proposed, wrote an article here this last week about uh, about uh, regulatory approvals take forever in the energy sector, and not just nuclear. Uh, and uh, it's uh, you know you can get ten years of review for a transmission line, and you know things like that that um, that uh, you know make it really hard for for companies to to move forward with. Um, so uh, they had some questions about regulatory. How would you assess, it's always tough to ask a bunch of customers here of how, how the regulators are doing for you all, uh, but take that aside. How would you assess uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on advanced nuclear, on new nuclear technologies, reviewing, uh, assessing in a timely manner uh, uh, to, uh, to, to potentially try to get things uh, moving forward? I'll, I'll start. Um, I think the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here in the United States, um, has done a decent job of modernizing 
or attempting to modernize their licensing framework and apply it to advanced nuclear technologies. Uh, it is definitely a chicken and egg kind of scenario because uh, they, they have staff that are trained on reviewing the, the advanced coolant technologies, for example, but you, you can't keep those folks sitting at their desks waiting for an application to, to show up. So, um, you know, it, it may, in a couple of years, th those folks may not be there. They might have moved on to, to other activities. So it's, it's a little bit of, you know, they need to anticipate um, what applications are going to be coming across their desks and be trained to review those applications. So that said, I think most of us on the panel, if not all of us would agree that having continuous dialogue with the regulator, not just the NRC, but, you know, the countries that we're playing in, continuous dialogue in um, drop-in meetings, in, in a periodic uh, check-in meetings to ensure that the regulator understands what we plan to bring to them. And then we also get feedback from them in terms of the blanks that we need to fill in in our application and the expectations that we need to meet for them, especially with Westinghouse. We've done this before, but the expectations for a micro reactor or the expect expectations for our lead cooled fast reactor, those are gonna be different than those for an AP1000. So we need to uh, make sure that we are talking early and talking often with the regulator. And, uh, you know, clearly change is needed, right? There were design license projects that lasted 10 years. Uh, with the NRC and, and you know, TerraPower needs to design and build and commission a reactor in seven years. So, so clearly change is needed, but uh, you know, I think one important thing, Senator Barrasso who led the Nuclear Energy uh, Innovation Modernization Act, that was Congress directing the NRC to change. And, and the NRC um, does need to be empowered to change. You know, they, they're a safety regulator. Um, they, they need that direction from Congress, which has now been provided. And I see them at the, you know, at the chairman and commission level and NRC senior management level. I really see um, some change leadership. I see them embracing the seven year ARDP schedules. Uh, we're in a 10 CFR 50 regulated process with the NRC for natrium. And um, I'm, I'm really seeing, you know, good interaction with, with the NRC. Um, so I, I think change was needed, but um, it, it's beginning to occur. Okay, great. Yeah, to, just to finish it up uh, for, for the day, I would, uh, the, the regulatory approvals across the board seem to have been dragging out over the last generation on pretty much everything. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, things take a very long time for, for a lot of approvals. And uh, I think, as Chris said, having congressional uh, change uh, in X to uh, to give uh, to give administrators guidance on how to clean up, how to move forward, and including uh, court court topics to clean them up, uh, is a way to try to get things moving forward in general. Uh, thank you again to our speakers uh, for joining us today, and thank you to our audience for joining in here on our fourth uh, Columbia Energy Technology Revolution Forum. Uh, one thing about uh, for tomorrow, on uh, 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 unrelated to this topic, but very topical, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, we're hosting an event at Columbia called Weaning Europe Off Russian National, uh, Natural Gas. I think that uh, we have a number of very uh, esteemed uh, guest uh, panel will be there, a lot from Europe uh, who've been doing gas work uh, for a long time. I'd recommend everyone look at that on the Columbia Energy website and sign up for that. Uh, and we have plenty of uh, all our other events uh, coming up uh, on, on that panel, uh, on, on that uh, website also. Uh, thank you again to the panelists and thank you for, uh, for uh, the several hundred people who joined you today. And uh, everyone have a good uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.